Thank you for listening to Learning with Learner and hearing the wisdom, stories, and ideas that will have you feeling inspired and ready to take on the world. If you've enjoyed this, please remember to share, rate, and review. It means the world to me and the team putting it all together. If you're looking for more information, you can find me at lindsaylearner.com. That's L-I-N-D-S-E-Y-L-E-R-N-E-R.com. Or if you've got any questions or curiosity about me, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok at Lindsay Lerner. Thanks again for listening and have an awesome day. Welcome to this week's episode of Cost of the Status Quo, featuring Venus Lau, a fitness expert who inspires others to find joy and empowerment through movement. Venus's passion for fitness runs deep, and it comes from a place of personal struggle and loss. She lost both of her parents to cancer in her 20s, and that experience drove her to commit to living her life to the fullest in honor of their memory. Her belief in the mind-body-spirit connection is not just an abstract idea, but a way of living that has helped her find strength and resilience through adversity. Despite the challenges that she's faced, Venus approaches fitness with a sense of playfulness and creativity that's truly infectious. She encourages her clients to break free from the conventional ideas of what exercise should look like and to explore movement in a way that feels authentic to them. For Venus, fitness is not just about aesthetics or weight loss, but about finding a way to connect to oneself and feel truly alive. In this episode, we'll delve into Venus's story, her training certifications, and her philosophy on fitness and life. Join us as we explore how Venus's approach to fitness can help us all find joy, resilience, and strength in our own lives. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I don't want to assume anything, but, you know, growing up in Texas, having Asian parents, like how has that impacted your your life? <laughs> Lots of drama. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of drama. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can unpack um, some of it, you know. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, who, do, who doesn't have trauma? And right. someone who's like, oh, I've lived such a great life. I'm like, wow, you haven't really dive, dived in a little bit deeper. Right. We all have trauma, <laughs> like whatever. Totally. But uh, yeah. And then being an athlete and, and actually I, I went to a psychic when I was 20 years old, a long time ago. I'm now in my forties and I don't, I still uh, don't believe that, but <laughs> I, I I'm a vampire. Um, I'm actually 127 <laughs> years old. Um, <laughs> that's, but, uh, that's more believable. <laughs> That's more believable. I know, right? Um, and and this this psychic told me that uh, I would be a teacher one day. And at the time, when you're 20 years old, your reference of teacher is like, you know, teacher at a school or like a college. And I was like, what? What the fuck? I'm not going to be a fucking teacher. Like, I remember just being like, no, I'm not. I'm he, This guy's so wrong. <laughs> like... I was like, he's so off. I'm not going to be a teacher. Yeah. And um, becoming a trainer in LA was a total accident. I mean, I did it because I had done all the jobs and I, I started in corporate after college. And then I whittled down into becoming more of like an artist in LA, you know, being a writer and working as a bartender and doing the, you know, it was really fun in your 20s. This is a lot of fun. I highly recommend it. Agreed. Were you d doing any sort of artistic, you know, I know you had to unfortunately put them as quote unquote hobbies, but like, were you exploring any of that when you got to LA, you know, away from Texas, away from, you know, parental yes. influence and everything? Yeah. I, I actually, I moved to LA to be a comedy writer and me and my best friend who's now my business partner and she is still writing comedy and crushing it. But, um, we moved to LA to write and within the first six months we moved out here we actually optioned a script to new line cinema and had a star attached it never ended up going into production but that was like really huge we were like in our early 20s and optioned a script within the first six months of living here so we had zero idea of what reality was in hollywood because <laughs> that's not normal <laughs> right that's definitely um, not normal yeah we're very tenacious um and we, we kept going for it and we kept writing different things and different projects and none of them really like took off, took off, but we did get a little bit here and there. And that, that one getting it optioned by a huge studio with a star attached was, was really cool. 
And then we also created a sketch comedy group that won uh, best sketch at LA Comedy Fest. And we also, <laughs> yeah, you can find me on YouTube. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not, my friends don't even know the link. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, I worked See, on a lot of other up. things <laughs> as well. Yeah. Um, and sure. then I got to a point where I was coming towards my 30s and I was like, I can't work mm -hmm. in a bar. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with it, because there's absolutely not. It's so much fun. But in my mind, I was like, I need to feel like I'm giving back to people. Like I had this moment when I was like 27, 28. I was like, I need to do something where I'm like helping people. And and again, I'm not talking down on anyone who works at a bar because it is very fun. I do feel like most people in their 20s should do a lot of fun things that allow them freedom especially in LA, like working at a bar in LA right. is really fun when you're 20. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I was like, no, I need to, I need to give back. I need to do more. So one of my best friends, actually same best friend was like, you should be a trainer. And I, I immediately was like, what? No. Cause I, everybody has the stereotype of what a trainer is. They're like meatheads. They like count all their calories. They have protein shakes at every meal. And you know, I, and you know, I was just like, no, I was like, I'm not that person. Like, yeah, I work out a lot, but I was like, I'm an athlete. I was a D1 athlete. I can't be a trainer, you know, like so pompous, but I didn't know. I didn't know what diverse variations there were in being a trainer and being a coach. So at first I put it down and then a couple months later, I was like, mm, maybe, maybe I will do that. <laughs> And that that's a very big theme in my life. I'm usually always like, mm, I don't know. And then a couple of months later, I'm always like, mm, okay. <laughs> and I got my first job at Equinox in Santa Monica. I didn't even have my certification yet. All the all the trainers that I admire, uh, yourself included, have all have this like Equinox connection. And then at some yes. point, they're like, this is terrible. And they just <laughs> run. <laughs> well, here's the thing. It's not terrible. It's a great place for a new trainer to start because they do encourage you to take a lot of CEUs, continue education courses. And I think that's really important. And that's why trainers who start at Equinox end up being great trainers is because they see the value in continued education. And I think that that's what made me fall in love with training. So yeah, it, it's it's like the more you know, you know, the more you know, the more you enjoy what you're doing. And I think that goes across all boards. That's good. And at this point, obviously, I mean, your parents had passed away when you were younger. And so was it easier for you to go down this path less traveled now? Or was it still you or did that add more pressure of like, I really want to become, you know, whatever it is that you wanted to become at that point? You know, I don't know. You know, I feel like we could all guess. I know I would take, I wouldn't have taken as many chances as I did if I didn't experience both of my cancers passing away from cancer at a very young age and watching them deteriorate and watching them go from being very A-type Asian, you know, tiger parents to before they passed away, I had to have, I got to have a lot of amazing, um, I got to, got to have a lot of amazing conversations with them and they would talk to me about, oh, wow, you know, I really wish I wasn't so hard on you on this. Or, you know, they would always be like, oh, you got to make money, you got to do this. And then by towards the end of their life, they were like, just be happy. My mom would be like, I used to get mad. She, she had she had a temper on her. And she was like, I used to get mad all the time. And now I just realized how much energy I wasted being mad about things. And I wish I didn't do that. So don't do that. Don't, don't do what I did, you know. And so I got to have a lot of great conversations with my parents. It didn't sink in, though, until I was having to face those things in my life, um, you know, after losing them and going through the transitions of my own life. Like, yes, I got it on a very logical level. And, and I'm grateful for that because not a lot, a lot of people get closure with their parents, whether they're alive or not, you know, in their lifetime. So I was, I was very grateful for that, but I also still spiraled in my twenties and went through very dark places of like not knowing who I was. Cause my whole life I did 
what my parents expect me to do. I was the good kid. I made great grades. I made went to a great school on a golf scholarship. I had great group of friends. I had the right friends. I had I did all the right things. And so in a way to answer your question, long story short, no, long story long. I think that if my parents were still alive and I didn't go through that process of losing them and them coming to those places of realizing that happiness is more important than anything else in life. No, I definitely would not have taken those chances. I would definitely would not have lived my life as free. I definitely would probably be working in corporate America right now, or I'd be a professional golfer because that's what my parents were grooming me for or something like that. And who knows what would have happened if I would have spiraled out of it or whatever. I can't predict what I don't know. My parents were both immigrants from China and they met in Chicago and they both worked at the Marriott in the restaurant. My dad was my mom's second marriage. Her first marriage, she married a guy to come to America did not know him, had three children with him, uh, had three jobs, ended up paying for 10 or 11 family members to come over to America. Yeah, my mom was a boss. Um, and then Holy shit. eventually divorced him and married yeah. my dad and then had me and then they moved down to mm. Texas and opened a restaurant. <laughs> Incredible. Of, yeah. In Texas, of, where in Texas? Like of all places. <laughs> like. I'm like, yeah, I remember going. growing up being like, why did you move here? Um, <laughs> they, and especially from uh, Chicago. I know, right? I They were supposed to move to Dallas. Then some random, I don't know if it was a family member or it was a friend, they were like, you should come out to San Angelo, Texas. There's no Chinese restaurants there. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, there's nothing oh, there. Oh, wow. But, um, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, so a that small is a wild. town in West Texas. And... um that's where I was born and raised. But yeah, it was definitely very, very hard growing up in Texas, being Asian, being named Venus, being a shy kid with glasses and not really like, I don't know. It was, it was, it was very hard. I didn't, it took me a long time to come out of my shell and to really sure. get a grasp of who I was as, as a human being. Totally. Totally. And then did you totally go opposite end of the spectrum when you ended up in LA? <laughs> you were like, I don't think so. I don't think so. I feel just I every year I for, feel more myself. Um yeah, I feel more myself every single year. And that's a really nice thing. And sometimes being myself is is can can bring you to dark places. But then uh, for the most part, I feel like it brings me to a lot of joy. And and it, it makes me appreciate like being different growing up, you know, growing up, it, I was like, this sucks. I hate being so weird, and different. My name's Venus, you know, um, <laughs> it rhymes with, <laughs> that was a joke I got all the time when I was a kid, but, um, I, I'm sure, but the, the older I get, the more I actually love who I am. And I love, I, I love and appreciate those hard times because it makes me go, it can't be any worse. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, I uh, really, really not feeling myself and like losing both of my parents to cancer and finally having freedom going, I don't know what to do with this, you know, not having expectations on me, being able to build the life I want. And, but when you grow up your whole life, not really given permission to decide what you want to do, do you spend most of your adulthood tr adulthood trying to figure out what that is? And there's something very beautiful about it. And there's also something very uh, rough. It's It could be rough around the edges. Yeah, without a doubt. Is that where your you know, philosophy around self-mastery comes into the, comes into play and how you're continuing to just constantly evolve and constantly evolve? Yeah. For me personally, my journey has been about, okay, what am I supposed to do? What is my purpose? And I think a lot of people, you know, they're in that place too. And <laughs> yes, we're, we're not all that unique. We're all very similar, right? And I think that we're all wanting to figure out what's that thing that makes us 
feel fucking awesome. It makes us feel fulfilled. And we we all know it. I mean, we see it on social media, like money doesn't make you happy. That perfect relationship doesn't make you happy. Like we know all this stuff, but you know what? At the same time, we do need money to survive. At the same time, we need connection to survive. At the same time, intimacy is so important. So it's finding that balance of all things, but also still going, what makes me, me? And going back to what you said, the self-mastery, it's like, the more I focus on building a skill that progresses, that teaches me lessons, that I fail at sometimes, and then I have those moments of like, oh my God, I'm, I'm getting it kind of thing. And whether that's physical or mental or emotional, those are the things that truly build that self-confidence. And when we're in that self-confidence, we find more peace with ourselves. And when we're in that peace, then we make the right choices of what we have to do next. And uh, if we're always seeking like the other things, which aren't bad, like I feel like it's all necessary. And I feel like it's so trendy on social media to say black or white, like this doesn't matter, but this does. I think it's, it depends on the person. It depends on where they're at. But at the end of the day, you can't argue that developing skills builds your confidence, like truly from the inside out. And that is what gains, makes you trust yourself. And when you trust yourself, you're okay no matter what you do and where you are, no matter how many mistakes you make. You're like, cool, I got this. Like, I fucked up, but it's fine. I'll figure it out, you know? And that's, that's really what most people need. I'm still trying to figure out how to communicate that, but I know that the easiest access point for human beings is the physical. It is the easiest access point. I don't think it's easy, but it's much easier to change your state, right? You're in your energetic state. If you are an energy person, it's easier to change your chemistry. If you're a science person, it's easier to change your emotions through movement, through physical movement, and then you can change all the other things. But to me, it's like, what's the entry point? Like, I always tell people, if, if you want to learn how to do a handstand, I'm not going to just throw you against the wall. <laughs> you know, it's not going to be like an Instagram post, right? You're right. We're going to make sure you're comfortable on your hands first, <laughs> you know, like things like that. So I always think like, that's what I've learned from being a coach. What's the easiest access, access point to get me to grow? You say you don't know. So you're at Equinox for, you know, quite some time. And then at what point was it, I'm going to go off on my own or what happened after that? It was, uh, I was only at Equinox for like seven months and I had a full roster of clients and I was like, I can make four times more money if I quit. <laughs> and also, even if I dropped a quarter of my clients. And so, cause that's what they, they were paying, you know, at, at, you know, that's what corporate gyms do. They, they do not pay their trainers very much, even though the, the person coming in, um, you know, the gym goer the client is, is still paying, paying the gym a lot of money. <laughs> so, you know, and, and, and no, no, sh no, sh you know, I'm not throwing down on, on corporate gyms. I think that there are really great places to start. Um, there are gyms out there though that do pay their trainers well. I want to say that not all gyms do that. It just depends on where. But um, you know, corporate is corporate. And I just decided I was like, I want to do my own business, and it's going to give me more freedom. At the time, I still wanted to be a writer. I was like, oh, just this just seems normal. So I asked my clients, I was like, if I went private, would you go private with me? And they're like, yeah. I was like, cool. You know, it was just kind of one of those things. It wasn't wasn't this big like plan. It was just like, I want more freedom is all it really was. And, uh, and that's just kind of what guided me to that place. Oh, that's really cool. And at what point did you start incorporating more of the mindfulness meditation into your movement practice? Because presumably a lot of the corporate Equinox training was more of like strictly physical, not necessarily these other elements that are so important. 
Yeah. I mean, especially back then. I don't know what it's like now, but I know, I mean, you know, I, that was 16 years ago. So back then it was definitely more about like physical fitness and science. And, and it, it, it mostly is in the fitness industry still now, but there is a big growth in mindfulness. There's a big growth in meditation and breath work. And so about five or six years into being a coach, I became really bored of the physical <laughs> and I was seeking something more. So I started doing body weight exercises and I looked into stuff online and I was like on YouTube and finding all these different body weight exercises. And there's a few people I started following. And then I wanted to go to a course that was coming through LA, but I noticed that I had just missed the course. I didn't realize like the dates and everything. I was like, oh, I was so bummed out. And I was talking to a friend about it. And she was like, you should take this thing called Animal Flow. I was like, animal totally. flow. I was like, that sounds dumb. <laughs> <laughs> this is how this is how I work, by the way. This is like a thing for me. Like I'm always like, nah. And then later like, I'm like, okay. It's good to know. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I always need time to like chew on things, you know. I don't like it when when like I'm I'm trying to be sold on something. I'm like, don't sell me. Just tell me what it's about and let me think about it. Um, but I was just like, Okay, I don't know. We'll we'll see. She's like, you'll you'll love it, Venus. It's like primal movement. They do all this really cool stuff. Your brain is really connected. I was like, okay, maybe, you know. So I was like thinking about it. And then obviously, you know, a week later, I was like, okay, I think I'm gonna do this. <laughs> so I signed up and I immediately fell in love with the movement, the challenge at the time I thought I was so strong. And and I was, you know, I'd been lifting weight since I was 13 years old. So I've, I've always been very, very strong, but I was not very mobile. So people think I'm super mobile. It took me, a, it took practices like animal flow and yoga, and primal movement and mobility training and breath work to get me as mobile as I am now. And, and I'm not like Gumby or anything like that. I'm just, I have good Girl, range of motion. I feel you. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, I took the, the course, fell in love with it. At the time, I was also starting to get into yoga and it was the same story with yoga. I was like, eh, yoga, like how challenging is that? <laughs> and then, <laughs> then I took a couple of classes. I fell in love with the teacher who was incredible at cueing. I'm still friends with her to this day. And I was just like, wow, this is, this is incredible. And I changed my practice and I stopped lifting heavy weights for a couple of years and I just mainly focused on body weight training and kettlebells. Marcus Martinez, he was the on it kettlebell master coach. Uh, and I had met him at one of his certification courses. And now he's still one of my best friends to this day. Were your clients cool with being on this journey with you? You know what? I have been very lucky. Yes, I, I've been very lucky. That's I, awesome. And, I, and it makes me realize that my clients didn't just choose me because I was good at training they liked who I am, you know, and that made me feel good. And I, I remember one time I, when I was at Equinox, this older trainer, he was like, hey, don't don't become friends with your clients, you know, keep it professional, you know, don't hang out with them. And I was like, uh, well, I have had dinner with all of them. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm breaking those rules. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, they were my my clients were amazing at trying things with me. And I was honest. I was like, look, I just learned this. So if you're not into it, we don't have to do it, but let's just, let's play with this. And so, you know, majority of them were like, cool, let's try it. And I think that's also for trainers out there, if they're listening, that is how you keep your clients because they see you evolve and you share it and you're honest about it. You're not like, oh, I'm so good at this. Like I was like, look, I just learned this. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just, we're going to play with this. And they really appreciated the play and the the growth and the, you know, the curiosity and just trying something new and experimenting and being like, Sometimes I'd be like, cool, this isn't really working right now, or I don't know how to teach you right now. So I'm going to go practice it and maybe we'll come back to this. Did that vulnerability, is that what assists you in really being able to achieve like your own personal growth and then being able to assist clients in that growth as well? Yeah, I think so. And, and it's interesting how you question that with, did your vulnerability at the time, I didn't see that as vulnerability at the time I just saw it as being honest. That brings up a thing that like 
I love vulnerability. I do think vulnerability is a strength. So I'm not dogging that at all. But I think vulnerability is an outcome. It's not an initi- initiation. Just like confidence is an outcome, it's not where you start. Boundaries is also an outcome. It's not where you start. And a lot of people on social media right now, and this is something I'm going to be talking more about. I'm just trying to figure out the words to say it. So <laughs> here we go. But um, the a lot of people are like, oh, boundaries, boundaries, this, boundaries, that. And yes, we need boundaries. Yes, they are important, but they're an outcome. Just like confidence. We need confidence. But confidence is an outcome, right? Vulnerability is important. Vulnerability is an outcome. You don't start with being vulnerable. You start by building trust in yourself. And that's where it comes back to the physical movement and the practice. What's the the easiest access point? And, you know, when you build confidence, you build skills, you trust yourself. Then it allow, it gives you, it's like, it's, it's like when you make the nervous system feel safe, it grants you access to more power. It grants you access to more cognitive ability, more mobility, speed, control. You have to make your nervous system feel safe first right? Vulnerability does not make you feel safe. <laughs> it's an Definitely outcome. Not. <laughs> you know, confidence does not make you feel safe. It's an outcome. Yeah. Oh, Boundaries I love that. don't make you feel safe. Boundaries is another word for limitations. Boundaries is a fence. Boundaries is an outcome of you knowing your worth and trusting yourself. Then you're like, no, I'm not going to do that. You're, you're not going to take advantage of me. I know who I am. Like, what? No, I'm not going to do that. But people like to call it boundaries and and they think that that's where they start. And I'm going to say something. It's so, I'm not with that. I'm really not. I think it's an, it's an outcome. No, I I love that. That's like a, that, that was like a pretty critical shift in thinking for me in this moment. So thank you for that. (laughs) That's awesome. I mean, like I said, boundaries are great, but they keep you limited. Yeah. But when you focus more on your trust and your worthiness in yourself and you build your own skills, you're like, yeah, well, like I can only go so far. And I think that's a more positive way. And not that I'm like toxic positivity, but I think it's a more, um, it gives us more permission to be experimental and individualize what that means. Because each person's boundary is just different just depends on how you're made and who you are and what you've experienced. So I think it's just much easier to go, well, focus on the good stuff. You know, if I was teaching you a squat, I'm not going to constantly say, uh, don't shift into your toes. Don't shift into your heels. I'm going to say, focus on driving through your feet equally. I'm going to tell you what to focus on, what not what to not focus on. How do you go about balancing the scientific elements and the holistic elements in your approach to fitness? And is there a specific philosophy or set of beliefs that are have been guiding you on this path so far? I think science and holistics really go together. When they were first created, they were meant to go together. I think it's I think science is great. I think science is important. It's it's facts. It's seeing what works, it's seeing what doesn't work, but it, it doesn't have everything. Everyone is very individual and uh, holistically, we're not taught to trust ourselves. We're taught to trust data. We're taught to trust science and not that those things don't matter. They, they do. But I think that if we focus more on ourself, you know, the whole trusting yourself is to me, another way of saying holistic. It's a way of saying connect within. And I think science is connecting on the external, which is still important, still necessary. And I think holistic is connecting on the internal and learning to listen to your body, your thoughts, your energy, what you're putting out there. I think that's really important, but no one teaches us that. So by the time we start to get exposed to that, most people, unless you know you were a kid growing up in LA, which I was not, <laughs> You know, you, you don't know what, no, I didn't know what yoga was. 
until I was much older. I didn't, I literally didn't sure. even know what yoga was. And when you thought, when I thought about yoga, I was like, oh, it's just like some hippie, you know, I didn't, or I thought, oh, it's someone in India, you know, um, right. I did not, I, you know, it, is, it sounds terrible to say that, but it was the truth. I'm an Asian from Texas. Like there was only so much exposure I had. And that's a lot of people. And I think that a lot of people, they don't realize that it's more of like, if someone doesn't agree with what you don't agree with, a lot of times it's just, they didn't have that exposure. That's the heart, the tough thing about the world. But uh, going back to like holistic versus science, it's external and internal and both matter. That's such a cool, I've never heard it explained that way. And I think that is so badass, especially in this, you know, so many, there's so many tech devices, wearable devices, everything is so external. How many steps? What is my heart rate? What am I doing? And rather than, and I, I admittedly got caught up in it as well with, you know, Apple watch and this pedometer and that pedometer, all these different things. And it took me so long to realize, oh, like, okay, maybe I didn't get my 10,000 steps in today, but I feel like crap. How can I listen to myself first <laughs> before I continue to strive and go and push myself based off of this, again, to your point, this external thing that doesn't actually know how I'm feeling <laughs> or where I'm at? <laughs> yeah. Um, and the external is, is, is like good feedback. It's a loop, right? External is great feedback, but feedback is not always should not always be taken to heart. And, you know, most devices are 30% off, <laughs> like, like not accurate. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not, not like they're on sale for 30% off. I wish, but um, <laughs> they're 30, they're 30% 30 inaccurate. And, and some are even more. And each person is different. Like uh, my resting heart rate is very high because I have a bicuspid pulmonary valve. I was born with it. So my heart rate gets up really fast. So it doesn't matter how conditioned I become. It's going to be a little bit more difficult for me my entire life to be as cardiovascularly conditioned as other people. Maybe I'm wrong. Look, I'm not a heart surgeon. Okay. But <laughs> that is what I found <laughs> because there has been times in my life where I've been extremely conditioned and I still will struggle with like running even just a mile. Like the thought of running a mile feels like a lot for me when it comes to data and it comes to listening to your body. That's another part of tuning in and building that trust with yourself, going on the physical journey of being able to start listening to the language of your body. And that is something you can't really teach people. You can, I could guide someone on how to do that. But each person and how they tap into their own body is very different. Sure. Do you have a specific set of practices or habits or anything that you do that allow you to get into that space? Breath work is a, is a big one. If we're not breathing properly, the nervous system doesn't feel safe. That's the science answer. Uh, breath work <laughs> also allows you to get present with yourself and listen to your body and feel your insides. And also it it allows your nervous system to be present. If you're not breathing properly, your movement practice, your thought process, you know, how you handle things is going to, it's going to suffer if you are not connected to your breath. And, th and that goes for even the most fit, physically fit people out there or the most woke people out there or the most calm people out there. It starts with breath work. And I, and you know, if we don't breathe, we, we don't live. Breath is literally a, a part of our force of life. I am a new New Yorker and have been, I'm not in the city. If I was in Manhattan, it would be a lot easier, but this is a side tangent that won't make it into the episode, but <laughs> looking for a gym and a community and a spit, like, I've, like I have my garage gym, but it's, you know, it's me it's by myself and like, your videos. I'm like, this is, it's, it's good. It's fun. It's great. It's, you know, it's getting me moving, but it's not the community and it's not being able to connect with like-minded people about that. And I think that's been the most difficult part about it is, and I think fitness in general, like there's so many, to your point earlier, there's so many different stereotypes of people talking about, well, fitness is X, Y, and Z and it's meatheads and it's <laughs> lifting things and it's picking things up and putting them down. And how do you, 
cultivate your community of people who care not only about fitness and being fit and being in shape, whatever that means, but bringing together a community of people that are values-based in their movement practice and, and really focusing on that, because it seems like that's a common thread with not only your personal work, but with your clients and more so a future forward-thinking vision of fitness in general. Community is really important. And I think that there are different buckets. So not, not like all of my social like community, like my, my friends work out the way I do. But we do have a common thread of really caring and giving back. But I have different buckets of friends. And that's another thing. Like, I think people are like, oh, I need to find a group of friends. And then they meet people and they're like, oh, well, they're so different from me. And sometimes being different is really great as long as people are looking to accept differences in other people. And like, I have a fitness group of friends. I do who are on all online business entrepreneurs and we talk about business a lot and we help each other out. We support each other. We're also very vulnerable with each other because we're coaches. So that's like, that's what we do. So it's really great if you're a coach to hang out with other coaches because then you can really understand what other people are going through um, and and give your advice and help each other out because there there's so many people who need coaches. So it's not, you know, it's not a competition at all. And in fact, it's almost like a a nice thing that me and my group of coach friends, we all coach very differently. You know, Uh, I'm, I'm dying to get some of them to do animal flow and and yoga and stuff like that with me. And they're like, no way, (laughs) you know, they're like, that's not my thing, Venus. And I'm like, it's not about you being, being your thing, you know? So of course there's that, there's always that, but I think it's so important to be a part of a community that you are, you're all going through a lot of the similar things. And then I also have other communities, like I have a queer community that I hang out with uh, in LA and none of them are in fitness, but we have a common thread. And so we can talk about that common thread and it's okay to have different buckets. You don't have, you're not going to find everything in one community. (laughs) And then I've been, (laughs) you know, (laughs) and then I've been going to dance class like three times a week. I did not grow up a dancer. I wish I did. Same. (laughs) Yeah. And and it's so fun. And I've been meeting really amazing people in that community as well. And I think it's it's really about putting yourself out there. So if you're if you really are seeking that, then look for other people. So like for you, if you know, I love that you use Venus Fit, maybe go on the Venus Fit private Facebook group and connect to someone else or be like, hey, I'm in this area of New York or, and uh, does anyone live in this area? want to meet up, totally. you know, and I will encourage yeah. that. I'm glad you, I'm actually really glad you said that. I'm going to actually start encouraging totally. that to people who yeah. do do fitness uh, or Venus fit For and sure. be like, Hey, if y'all know each other, get together. Right. Uh, even if that means that, Oh, maybe I should fly to different places and like host like a Venus fit workshop for my members and be like, let's get to know each other. Let's create that community. Yeah. I think it's, it's just so interesting thinking through to your point, like these different buckets and different interests and meeting and gathering around an interest versus gathering around values. I think there's something underlying in you really appreciating animal flow and yoga and more of these like primal movements in the meditation and the more meditative practices that go along with it versus going strictly for, you know, athleticism. And when you put those two things together, that's, you know, clearly where the magic happens being like, I just, um, fan f- from a fan perspective, the integration of kettlebell and flow, like game changer, it's insane. I'm like, can every single professional athlete do this? You would be yes. 10 million times better. <laughs> like it would be, it would be so cool. And 1, to your, percent. yeah. And to your point about doing, doing events around that, I think it, what's interesting is I started hosting events. I don't know, it's like six months ago or so based on movement, meaningful conversation and music. Since those are, this is very selfish. These are the things that I love. And I was like, I think other people love these things. I love that. Yeah. Like, let's see what happens. And I ended up connecting with this guy who owns a movement studio in Union Square. So helpful central location in New York, but all summer, like that's basically what we're going to do all summer is bring people together based on those things. And that's, what's been 
so damn cool. I wish it was in my backyard instead of, you know, taking an hour to get there. But to your point, being able to to curate that and to put it out there has been so cool because, you know, 15 minutes of wiggling around and getting present, getting out of your head and into your body and, and being there, then connecting with people in the room who value those same things and then, you know, rocking out at the end of the night. What else do you need? I think all of that to say that's what I just appreciate about what you're doing and how how you've gone about doing it. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. And I, and I love watching you post your videos and tagging me and being, I'm like that, that makes me so happy when people do that. <laughs> it means, it really does. It, make, it means a lot. Well, it's, it's so cool. And I think it's just interesting in general with, you know, with Mike and Animal Flow and the community that's been built around that, like, that's just, you know, that's interesting to think about. And, you know, I've got two more questions before we, before we wrap up. I think for you, when you're thinking bigger picture, if you could wave a magic wand, what would the world or what would your life look like? Right now, really, uh, it would look the same way as it does now, but just on a bigger scale. <laughs> um, I'd like to reach more people. Uh, I'd also have a little bit more freedom and really dialing into my message more. That's something I'm going to be working on this year. I feel like till up to this point, I just do like what I do and it's great, but I, I, I know I get to really dial in more on, on the messaging and to, to really find the people that resonate with that. I don't want to be salesy. I want to like find the people that are aligned with it, you know, and to me, that's more important. That's then you don't have to really worry about a lot of stuff. And then also, um, finding, finding a really great life partner, uh, is a really thing, a big thing that I want to have, but it, again, it has to be in alignment. I don't want to just do it for the fear of being lonely. I want it to be where it feels really aligned and, just continuing to build my community and, and, and build what I do and, uh, you know, launching this podcast and seeing where that takes me and seeing where the next time someone suggests something. And my, my reaction is at first, no, nah, I don't know, you know, and then later on going, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then seeing that grow. Is that a, is that a gut thing when, when you're like, mm, no, does that, where does that come from? Is that like a, a, just a gut reaction? And then you think about it or are you overthinking first and then, <laughs> deciding so I my gut has never been really that right my tuning into to frequency and energy is always more right but I don't get those I don't get those immediate hits I'm very much a person that like I like to chew on things at least for 24 hours so a lot of times when people ask me to do something, I'm always like, oh, let me think about that or let me check with someone or let me, you know, because I've realized that whenever I have done that in the past and I immediately jump into something, a lot of times I will either regret it or I kind of go back and go, oh, I wish I responded this way instead, or I wish I would have really thought about it. Um, I didn't even look at my calendar and I actually wasn't available. It just, as I've gotten older, I'm less reactive. And as I've gotten older, I realize it's better for me personally. Everyone's different. I think some people, they follow their gut and that is their thing. For me, it's I have to listen to my, my, how my energy is feeling. And am I coming from a place of neutral or, if I, or am I coming from a place of like under excitement or over excitement, <laughs> you know? Mm. Oh, I love that. This, but too good. That, that's my that's my woo woo part of me. Like I'm really into human design and things like that. So <laughs> I am I'm with you on the woo woo spectrum. We can yeah. all day, all day. <laughs> I can talk about that stuff all day. <laughs> <laughs> Separate podcast. <laughs> Separate podcast. I don't don't worry. It's not something I talk about in Venus Fit. <laughs> Venus Fit. I very much focus on the physical. <laughs> because I don't I don't I know, consider I've myself to... an expert on it. <laughs> Totally fair, but I could talk about it all day. So I feel you on that one. For sure. <laughs> Last question. What is the worst piece of advice that you've ever gotten? Mm -hmm. And what's the best piece of advice that you've ever gotten? Mm, let's see. I've gotten a lot of bad advice. Um <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of bad <laughs> advice out there. Uh, a lot of bad advice on social media, but it's really fun to mm. watch, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> bad, 
advice always ends up becoming memes. Mm, gifts. Fair. Um, 100%. I mean, I think the most common one people say, and I've said it too, is just be yourself. <laughs> because if you're already going into a situation, and a lot of times it's someone going into a situation and they're feeling nervous or, you know, something's at stake and your friends are like, just be yourself. Oh, you're going on that date and you're nervous. Just be yourself. Oh, you're going for the interview and you're nervous. Just be yourself. Like that doesn't help anyone. When has that ever helped anyone? Whenever I'm like, oh man, I've got this thing coming up. Just be yourself, Venus. Uh, when am I not myself? Then you, you know, then you just go into that spiral <laughs> I'm here all of the time. thinking. <laughs> um, I think that, and I know it's meant it's meant to be kind. It's meant to be supportive. But I think a better version of that would be like, you know, be the self that you know you truly are, that sometimes you're scared to show. And if you can't do that, what's something that you know you're really good at? And like, do that a few times and like, be in that energy and connect to what is true to you and then go into that nervous situation, you know? And I'm sure th that is basically what be yourself means, but that's like a very over explained version of it. But uh, I think there's a lot of, <laughs> we need more nuance. That, yeah. We need more nuance. Um, mm. There's a lot of advice out there. That's, it's so general that it's very like, uh, it's going to age me very much, you know, John Madden quotes, yes. you know, you, if you're free if anyone listening, <laughs> if they're still listening to me, um, <laughs> Uh, the John Madden quote, it, it usually, he was a football commentator and he always would say the obvious, yeah. like he'd be like, in order to win this game, they gotta, they gotta make more touchdowns. It's like, no shit. <laughs> you know, like be yourself. No shit. <laughs> Is that what we're um, here for? <laughs> that's not what we're here for. Uh, the, the best advice, connect to what makes you happy. Go where you're wanted. Yeah. It's a hard one. It's really, it's a hard one that is, is hard to learn but go where you're wanted and don't, don't force it when it's, you're not wanted there. Cause I, I'm very much a Leo lion and I have forced many things, <laughs> which is why now I try to be better about being like, let me think about it. <laughs> and how do I feel about it? And when people say, when people, okay, that's another one. When people say you are not your feelings. Yes, we are. If we weren't our feeling, we are, we absolutely are. I think it's such bullshit. And they're like, you're not your feelings. Yes, you are. If we weren't our feelings, marketing would not work. If we weren't our feelings, lo love songs would not be written and we wouldn't be so addicted to them. If we're not our feelings, we wouldn't have opinions. We are our feelings, but it's about understanding what's underneath the feeling. That's another nuance that people don't get into it's like yes, I know. you are I, your feelings totally your feelings do matter other people right. or when another i'll give you another one let's work keep, keep going <laughs> i <laughs> love see this shit on social media all the time <laughs> or when people are like be like be be uh you know no one others no one's opinion matters but yours yeah but people matter we are community-based creatures i'm not saying that some asshole who being, you know, trolling your page, his opinion matter, that, that doesn't matter. No, of course not. But be mindful of other people, you know, like there's nothing wrong with being selfish, but don't be selfish and also an asshole to other people. <laughs> you know what I mean? And Truly. I, there's, there's so much Truly. black and white behavior on self-improvement mm. out there. And I think the right. nuance is really important. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of this today. I mean, my head feels like it's going to explode from everything that I've learned. So <laughs> I appreciate it so much. And I appreciate you taking the time to share with our audience. And I can't wait for everyone to hear this. It means a lot. Awesome. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me on. Um, you're, you're fun to talk to. And I really appreciate all the support that you give back to Venus Fit. So, yeah. Awesome.
Welcome to Learning with Learner, where we embark on a transformative journey of knowledge and personal growth. I'm Lindsay Lerner, your dedicated host and guide as we delve into the depths of unconventional wisdom. Together, we'll explore the stories and insights of remarkable trailblazers who have forged their own paths. Brace yourselves for thought-provoking conversations, profound insights, and eye-opening experiences. Our mission is to challenge the norm, ignite curiosity, and empower you to embrace your unique journey. This is Learning with Learner.